Um, I'm the first one. I'm Gary Berteg, and in Norway they say Berteg. And um, anyway, I wanted to um, just begin by saying, like so many of the other speakers, how I really feel honored to be invited to speak. And one of the reasons is that uh, when, I, when I came here on Friday, I uh, immediately felt this um, reality of what Baha'u'llah says when he, he writes that in the Seven Valleys, he says, enter thou amongst my servants and enter thou my paradise. So um, I immediately felt that here, and, and that's one of the reasons I feel so, so um, honored to, to speak. <clears throat> no. Um, okay, this is a uh, wireless. Yeah. Uh, okay, good. Now, in in the um, to to cut right to what what I'm hoping to achieve here. Um, I'm going to show you some images of work that I've done <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> try and establish for you uh, some of the uh, considerations that, that I feel may be useful with regard to the uh, direction that we've received from, from the Universal House of Justice where, <clears throat> excuse me, where they say the five-year plan ushers in a new stage in our efforts to promote the arts in the life of the cause. As with all other aspects of the expansion and consolidation work, the requirements of the time call on us to be more systematic in the use of the arts. They should not be considered simply an embellishment to our programs or an afterthought in our planning. Rather, they must become an integral part of our teaching plans and community life. The arts have a vital role to play in the process of entry by troops. And I'm quoting here from a letter addressed to the uh, counselors, the continental counselors, all continental counselors from the International Teaching Center from the 5th of November, 2001. Um, you'll notice that the um, Association for Baha'i Studies has really made an effort to um, scatter the arts throughout the process of our experience here. And I feel like, for myself, it's a, it's a real confirmation of the uh, responsiveness of, of the institutions throughout our community to this premise. This is a premise, and it's a profound thing. When we look at um, civilization, you know, this conference is related to that theme of spirit in action. What are the, what are the things that really stand out about civilization? There are things that symbolize um, the achievements of the human spirit manifest. And there's quite a broad range of such artifacts. Some of them are objects, some of them are ideas. Last night we, we heard about Archimedes and Plato, the ar architects of Western thought in many respects. We've also um, with us um, illustrious thinkers who have um, contributed to the current forms of thinking, as well as, for example, the, the, the terraces on the world, at the World Center, represent a kind of form that we don't see. This is a new form, very exciting. Abdu Baha says that in the future, there would be a, um, a new form of art that's uh, composed of, of all the former. He says, this is from Star of the West. There will be a new art, a new architecture, fused of all the beauty of the world of the past, but new. Now, um, to begin this, um, let me just say that um, I've spent some time in the Arctic, um, and 
there's different ways of hooking up dogs. This is just a kind of an aside to let you know <laughs> sort of how I think. Um, basically, there's two types of, of uh, ways to harness dogs to pull a sleigh. One is in a row, and the other is in a fan, <laughs> fan shape. And it really depends on the terrain. Um, if the terrain's pretty smooth, you can hook them up in a row and, you know, go lickety-split. But if the terrain is really complex and, and difficult, it's very wise to hook them up in a fan shape because, you know, they can all find purchase in different ways as you move across this kind of quite, quite complex environments. And I feel that um, we're at that stage in, in the use of the arts where in my own thinking, I have to kind of hook up my dogs in, in the fan shape. I can't really expect to go straight to the point. And I hope you'll bear with me in that respect, uh, that, that I, it's not, I'm kind of a non-linear presentation. Um, the first thing I'd like you to consider with respect to using the arts in all aspects of our planning is that the arts are uh, a way of knowing. Uh, this is simply put, I don't want to argue about knowing as a philosophical uh, kind of state. But we, we have in the modern period really uh, given a tremendous um, credibility to science and much less so to art or the arts. Is it, oh, this is better. <clears throat> um, I don't like the sound of my own voice, so when it's down here, it's not so bad. <laughs> Let's uh, see if I can get this on the screen. Um, this, this, first, um, this first passage, um, if, I'm sure most of you uh, know this. Um, I, uh, I call this in my own um, conversations with people, I call this the tablet of the fashioner and, and the omniscient. And when you look at it closely, the, the main thing about it is that Baha'u'llah braids both science and art together in the same breath. And when we look at the hallmarks of civilization, what do we see? We see the great temples and sacred buildings, uh, whether they're for kings or deities, have brought together the best of technology and the best of art. If we look at, uh, say, bronze vessels in China, again, it's the same sort of thing. These, these national treasures bring together the best in, in science and art. Currently in our world, if we look at film, um, we see a, a kind of braiding together of science and technology, the physics of optics and chemistry of film and emulsions and so on, and the arts. This is, this is simply to indicate to you that um, the two things together uh, are fundamental to uh, what we consider to be civilizing artifacts. So if you look closely at almost any aspect of your life, whether it's food, whether it's shelter, whether it's clothing, transportation, you'll notice that uh, everything brings these two together. You know, we have uh, uh, fabrics that, that are the result of um, agriculture and the result of chemistry, organic chemistry. And we have systems of uh, laws that define boundaries of fields and of uh, corporate structures and exchanges and so on and so forth. And it's very, very technical. However, at the point where the human being is going to utilize these things, they have to be made beautiful because we tend to prefer something that's beautiful 
to something that's just simply practical or uh, utilitarian. So um, let me give you an example that um, I hope you can all take back to your communities because we love um, potlucks so much. This is, this is one of our, our big civilizing elements is the potluck. <laughs> and I mean this uh, because food is one of the core uh, unifying elements in human culture, human society. Um, all of the trajectories that come out of our environment that develop food stuffs, you know, like uh, you have to do irrigation maybe for tomatoes and you have to have weather satellites so that you know whether they're going to freeze or not. And then you need road systems and trucks and, you know, supplies of fuel and so on to get the tomatoes from Florida or California to Yellowknife and uh, so on and so forth. And this applies to every element of food that you end up with in your grocery bag. So anyway, you go and you, you bring these things back to the house and you prepare a meal. Now, if you prepare a meal for a guest, um, generally you put some effort into it and you, uh, you prepare it in, a, in the best way that you can and you serve it in a very considered way. So you set the table and you set it beautifully and you might include candles and you might include a few other things and your guests arrive and you, you eat. Now, the technical elements are completed as soon as the table is set with the food and you begin to eat. As soon as you begin to eat, the art takes over. Because it's in that environment, that context of beauty, the way it is served, the way it tastes, the way it is presented, the attitudes and feelings it's presented with that give you the aesthetic experience. And people will pay tremendous amounts for a culinary experience because it is aesthetic. It does become memorable. Now, following the meal is when civilization begins to take off because it's after the meal that we begin to have discourse and we talk about things. We talk about stories, we talk, sometimes we sing, we may even have a drama and uh, if you look closely at uh, many ceremonies, um, you can see where the performing arts are generally related to the follow-up on feasting. So when we, when we begin to discourse after a meal, it's in the discourse that we have ideas, we make plans, we think about things, options, possibilities, etc. And that's where civilization occurs. Civilization occurs between people as defined by their relationships and as nuanced by the meal and all kinds of other things. No. So if we look at Baha'u'llah's comments here, he says um, there's uh, animating energies in, in this word, the fashioner, and it stirs all created things and gives birth to the means and instruments whereby such arts can be produced and perfected. All the wondrous achievements you now witness are the direct consequences of the revelation of this name. In days to come, you will verily behold things of which you have never heard before. And this is um, a good sign of what's in store for us um, as we, we begin to use the arts. Remember, uh, Baha'u'llah says that the purpose underlying the whole of creation is in order that one soul would recognize him, his revelation. So here we are. We've all recognized Baha'u'llah. We are, in effect, why the whole creation was brought into existence. The Seven Valleys, Baha'u'llah says, dost thou reckon thyself but a puny form when within thee the universe is folded? What does this mean? It means that we have a tremendous capability to manifest energies and 
those energies materialize in civilizing artifacts. These artifacts, let me say again, are things like ideas, thoughts, and objects, processes. And when Baha'u'llah pulls this together with science, you see how powerful it is to realize that art and science are both ways of knowing. They're both ways of enabling human beings to establish civilizing artifacts. So let's begin to um, try to understand that art, in contrast to science, tends to imply rather than define. Science tends to define. It makes efforts to um, obtain understandings that are based on um, observations of nature. Facts, theories, and so on are constructed, and we begin to have increasingly clear understandings about the relationships that pertain within nature. However, in art, if you've been to a theater, uh, and you, what you need to do in, in art is you have to suspend your disbelief in order to experience what you're going to encounter. You know, you have an understanding that the play is written, that the costumes and sets are constructed, and that the actors are acting. But if you can suspend your disbelief, you can have a transforming experience. This means that the, the experience is coming out of human nature through a vehicle and affecting human nature. You can bring your dog to the play and it won't really be transformed. <laughs> it just won't. <laughs> but a human being will be because we are experiencing something that comes from human nature. It doesn't come from nature, it comes from human nature. And in the writings, Abdu'l Baha goes to lengths to distinguish between uh, the reality of nature and human nature. Um, anyway, it's just to, to try to suggest to you that um, when we, we move people uh, by troops into the faith, into our community, we need to be able to give them experiences that are transforming experiences, as well as understandings that are transforming understandings. If we only have one or the other, we do not have enough. We need to bring both to bear. And uh, yesterday, when, when I was listening to the comments about the black man's gatherings, that's one of the things that I felt was really evident, is that the prayers provided everyone there with the experience of the faith. So how do we bring the arts into our devotional gatherings? This is an important question, and I'm not going to provide an answer because it's too early. There, there's so many different things that people can try out and do. How do we bring um, the arts into our potlucks? Let's, I would like to recommend that the potluck, the next potluck that you have, try to make it so it's not an assembly line, so that it's not a, um, uh, an efficiency model, you know, where, where you try and get as many people through the process as possible as quickly as you can. Try and make it something that integrates everyone somehow. Like maybe put desserts on one table and you know, all the different things on different tables and they have to go around and mingle or something. I don't know exactly what. But try, try and break that efficiency model, which is an, an understanding model, and move it over to an experiential one that engages human beings with each other. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know what, what, how much time do I have? I've probably used up all my time already. Um, Here's another thing. I, I wrote to the, uh, to the uh, research department and asked about this, this uh, quote from Gleanings about what I, uh, I just showed you on the screen, this one. 
And um, what they wrote back to me is this, that this section is excerpted from a longer tablet revealed by Baha'u'llah. The section selected by Shoghi Effendi for translation is the only part of the tablet that deals specifically with the creative power of the revelation. The tablet does not have a particular name or title by which it is known. It was, however, addressed to a certain MH. The research department has not to date been able to identify the full name of the recipient. Now, they then go on and they provide three following extracts for my information. And some of you know this, this quote. One of the names of God is the fashioner. He loveth craftsmanship. Therefore, any of his servants who manifesteth this attribute is acceptable in the sight of this wronged one. Craftsmanship is a book among the books of divine sciences and a treasure among the treasures of his heavenly wisdom. This is a knowledge with meaning, for some of the sciences are brought forth by words and come to an end with words. And it's in that, in that quote, and I'd love to share the other two with you, but I don't think I have time. It's just there that I see the, the absolute clarity of my point is that the arts are a way of knowing. And as such, we are well advised by the Universal House of Justice to incorporate the arts in all aspects of our planning, from beginning to end. This is going to have a reshaping and civilizing effect on our community lives. The message to the counselors um, uh, suggests ways that the arts can be um, brought into focus through the devotional gatherings and the study circles in children's classes. And so there again, these are three continuous uh, conditions or environments in which the arts can be explored. This is not to say that everyone's an artist. Um, I uh, feel it's quite important that somehow this be understood. You know the, the Tablet of Wisdom, um, I don't have the quote right in front of me, so I'll probably misquote it, but Baha'u'llah was asked about um, how creation was brought into existence, and he says something like this, that know that it, that it was brought into existence through the heat uh, that results from the interaction between the active force and that which is its recipient. These two are the same, yet they are different. And as a, as a performer, I used to sing for you know, a rock and roll band. And uh, one of the things that you felt instantly was that when, as soon as you started singing, the audience met you. And it's in the meeting that it's like an arc above both the audience and the performer, that this is where the magic happens. And you as the, as the singer are the active force, but then the audience responds with its applause and they're the active force. And in between you, you feel lifted. You're given a new uh, sense of, of what is accomplishment, of encouragement. And um, this is the, the reality of, of bringing the arts into our experience. We can be simultaneously audience and performer. We can be simultaneously the active force and that which is its recipient. These two are the same, yet they are different. And this is the, this is the beauty of realizing that we don't all have to be artists, but we do need to be an audience as well. We need to be sensitive and receptive. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to just show you something, um, if I can. Uh, let's see. How do I get rid of this? I'm not sure. Just automatically. Oh. I'm supposed to be a media kind of guy, but sometimes I, I get quite, quite uh, puzzled by these things. And, you know, a lot of people blame Microsoft. Let's see if I can 
there's just another thing here. I'm going to show you some pictures, I think. Oh, it just... This is uh, Rizwan Mokbel's computer. He kindly lent me. Huh. I'm looking for the... It's gone. A device. My disk drive isn't going to play. Pardon me. Well, it, it doesn't show up on the... Um, Double-click what? Hmm. Well, I, I had them there. Yeah. Yeah, why? No, no, that's a different thing. That's a different one. Yeah, it's... I don't want to reboot. Hmm. Well, I have um, I have a series of pictures here I want to show, and they've just disappeared. Oh, we want the uh, CD drive, and it's not going to show up. Could you uh, see if you can find it? No, I'll, I'll just keep chatting here. Um, the we want the CD drive. That one. Try that. Yeah, that's a local disc. That's CD. Uh, no, we want. Uh, it's just not showing up. Hmm. Yeah, it's not enabled. So, ten minutes left. Oh dear. Um, I wanted to show you a set of images that are uh, representative of an understanding that I have about painting. And we'll just see what happens, uh, whether or not I can actually show them to you. Um, but I can go on anyhow, and uh, I will. What, what I'm going to say is that there are three really long-standing uh, ways that human beings have made images. And the first is representation. And throughout uh, the last 50,000 years, there's evidence that uh, human beings have made efforts at uh, creating images in the sense that they are seen. You know, we're trying to recreate or reproduce or replicate, represent these particulars. Now, <clears throat> as, as you look at art history, you'll realize that the different cultures have what we call conventions or sort of formulas or theories of how to represent. So the Chinese have a method where they put the biggest thing in the background in a, a sort of human scale like a building in the midground and the human being in the foreground. And you get this kind of compressed but vast space that feels like you're in the mountains. The Western tradition, say, that we're most familiar with might be the vanishing point perspective. So we put the biggest thing in the foreground and a middle ground, we have a medium size, and in the distance, we have the smallest thing. It's just the inversion, but they both work. And so what happens then is that every culture has a kind of convention uh, system for representation. Now, I, isn't it interesting that, oh, I'm over time. No? Oh, good. Isn't it interesting that we have in our faith the perfect exemplar, Abdu'l Baha, who we are supposed to represent? We are supposed to try in whatever ways we can to 
show how he lived in our own lives. In a sense, we are representing Abdu Baha uh, to the best of our ability within our limits. And when we think about families and communities and cultures, we'll see that each of those stages of collectiveness have a capacity to reflect Abdu Baha's life to represent it in a certain way. And this is as it should be, because we have this instinct to represent. Children do it all the time with their parents. They model the way they walk and the way they talk and so on and so forth. So be like Abdu Baha. And this is one of the fundamental instincts that we have as people. Second is a kind of um, uh, what we call doodling or pattern making or mapping. And mapping in art has to do with the idea that we create external models of internal conditions. And the, I, I feel that, uh, I feel that one of the things that most of the modern period has addressed in, in art is this issue of how we can investigate those realities of this instinct to create external models of internal conditions. And so sometimes it's very abstract. However, isn't it interesting that in our own faith, we have this same capacity evident. We have it evident in the institutions and all the institutions that Baha'u'llah has given us enable us to create external models of internal conditions. So. We create an external model by our contribution of the inner condition. So the funds, so the feasts, so the marriages, so all the collaborative and consultative elements that we bring into focus are this same instinct that we see in the arts. The interest and the, and the facility we have to create external models of internal conditions. You got it. Okay, I got one here. Yeah. Four minutes? Perfect. Um, just on this, um, I'll use the pointer here, and you can see this section, this section is the representational section. This section is the abstract or mapping or doodling or pattern making section. And then these white bars are what is the third thing that we do in the arts, which is symbolize. These for me symbolize the kind of veil between the worlds, you know, the veil between states of being. Any boundary that we establish represents or establishes a relationship. And in the Baha'i community and in many communities, we know the power of symbolizing. And so we have holy days that we um, pay attention to. We have symbolic acts. Uh, for example, a few years ago, the National Assembly of the United States brought up the, uh, the original tablet of the, of the divine plan to the National Assembly of Canada. This is a symbolic act. These symbolic acts are gathering points. Again, a symbolic act is not an understanding. It's an experience. It implies, it does not define. And a symbolic act is an act of art. And these are powerful, powerful points of establishing connectedness and unity. So um, all these all these paintings I wanted to show you, uh, unfortunately we won't be able to see, they are an exploration of this uh, concept, this, this kind of idea of, of uh, braiding these three things together. And then along with that, <clears throat> uh, there's some writing in them. And um, it seems to me that when we approach a work of art, we approach it with our right brain. When we approach a, a written statement, we approach it with our left brain. We expect a certain kind of content to emerge from a written text. 
and we expect a certain kind of experience to come from approaching a work, uh, a painting or some other object. And it's the two things together that create a whole experience, a whole minded experience. Now, uh, I'll just quit that and I'll have to conclude here quite quickly. Uh, it's changed again. Oh well. Um, and so it goes with, with these uh, media things. <laughs> Um, if anybody's interested, I can show you some slides later or something. Um, the, there, there's so much, um, you know, I've spent my, most of my adult life as a Baha'i. I became a Baha'i when I was 19. And I said to myself, if it doesn't work, I'll leave. But it works. It keeps working. It keeps enticing and en enlightening. And I learn from... I learn from the faith, and I learn from my, my painting, I learn from my teaching, I learn from my family, I learn from my community, I learn all around. The trick is, how do you create um, an echo back? What is it we can do to find a, a thing, a, an object, a statement, a concept that will inspire, will be a portal into the revelation for others. And I, I just want to submit to you that this guidance from the House of Justice requiring us to give attention to the arts in all aspects of our planning is profound. It's very, very exciting. It will, this is the seeds. These are the moments that will generate a new form that Abdu'l Baha describes this this combination of all that is beautiful in the past and make a new architecture and a new new art. Okay, I guess I'm out of time. I'm very happy to be part of this ABS conference and share this platform with these other fine artists. It's an honor. I don't have a lot of time since I would like to share with you some sequences of choreography on video as well because really the stage is my platform. Nonetheless, it is a healthy process for artists to verbalize what they believe to be the inner drive in their work, as this also helps them crystallize more concretely in their own mind their aspirations as well. This panel, furthermore, is an important opportunity for people to understand a little more what it means to be an artist, what it, in, what it entails. Every artistic process is different and unique. And this panel we're having is a wonderful opportunity for, for me to learn as well. When Abdu'l Baha said, I rejoice to hear that thou takest pains with thine art. Maybe you've seen that quote before. It showed that he understood the artistic process, what it could entail, and that it can be a solitary and often difficult experience. For this reason, the artist in the Baha'i community needs tremendous encouragement and understanding, not just from the other artists, but the community as a whole. Although the artist should obviously not value himself strictly by other people's comments, his unique contribution to the advancement of the cause must be recognized, and this can be done, as Gary said, in many different ways. As the arts take on an ever more prominent role in proclamation and teaching, I am reminded of the great art that has been produced throughout history. Art that was initially considered ugly, bad, that was denounced, scoffed at. And now these works are considered masterpieces. I think the community as a whole should reflect on this as its artists go about refining their craft. The Baha'i artist has the potential to create the most unique, the most refined art imaginable. It is also inevitable that our traditional notions of grading art derive from the moral fabric of the society we live in, where the criteria for what is considered art of quality can be considered, can be considered more than dubious. Baha'is should constantly remind themselves to look upon all art with fresh eyes, with a keen sense of its purpose. In Tablets of Baha'u'llah, Baha'u'llah says, Beware, O my loved ones, lest ye despise the merits of my learned servants, whom God hath graciously chosen to be the exponents 
of his name, the fashioner. That word comes up so many times. The one day there'll be a choreographic work on the word fashioner. Exert your utmost endeavor that you may develop such crafts and undertakings that everyone, whether young or old, may benefit therefrom. We are quit of those ignorant ones who fondly imagine that wisdom is to give vent to one's idle imaginings and to repudiate God, the Lord of all men. This is such a strong warning about what our attitude and mindset should be with regards to any work about to be undertaken. We would all agree that not all endeavors undertaken in any particular sphere have as their underlying goal the love of God. So with talent comes responsibility. Not every work of art, furthermore, not all chaos that is channeled through our thought process should be thrown to the public with the justification that anything goes. I have to get it out. You can get it out and then you can censure yourself. There are always choices to be made. You can choose the canvases, the canvases you wish to display. You can choose the compositions you wish to share. You can choose the poems you wish, the poems you wish to publish. This summer, I was at the BAM Center for the Arts working on a choreographic work for six weeks, which I eventually called Covenant. It was a very intense and wonderful experience, and I would be very engrossed in my work in the studio, working very intensely with the dancers many hours at a time in this bubble, creative bubble. And at the end of the day, I would, I would walk outside, and there are these incredible mountains. For those of you who have been in BAMP, you know what I mean. These mountains reflecting attributes of God, such as grandeur, majesty, omnipresence, these beautiful forms that were there long before I was born and will be there long after I've passed on. And they impressed upon me the realization that our time on this earthly plane is so short. And this occasion in Banff made me question even more deeply the relevance and motivation of my creative process. I kept asking myself, what contribution do I want to make as an artist? Well, Baha'u'llah has given us many hints in tablets, of, in tablets as well, on page 168, he says, at the outset of every endeavor, it is a, a incumbent to look to the end of it. Of all the arts and sciences, set the children to studying those which will result in advantage to man, will ensure his progress and elevate his rank. Well, my main drive at the heart of all my work as choreographer is my preoccupation with this one question. How in my work can I elevate man's rank? What does it mean? How can this be done? I wrote a grant proposal for an arts council recently, and I wrote down something which flowed quite spontaneously when I was describing my creative process, which caught me pleasantly off guard. What I wrote was that it was more important for me that the spectator remember how he felt following a performance as opposed to what he remembered seeing. Now, this might sound kind of obvious to some and maybe trivial to others, but what I was getting at was that for me, the physical vocabulary in the dance is a platform, a vehicle by which to bring the audience to an emotional place, a place that the spectator can relate to, not just movement for movement's sake. Now, Shoghi Effendi said, the core of religious faith is that mystic feeling which unites man with God. And he goes on to say that this quote, unquote, sense of spirituality is acquired chiefly, chiefly by means of prayer. Well, this is the raison d'etre of art as well. That is to bring to people's hearts the mystical quality, the mystical quality of being alive in the physical world. I'm gonna give a personal example of this. Um, a few years ago, a Baha'i friend of mine who had a bachelor's degree in sociology was working on an honors seminar and, and the focus of her project was, how do Baha'i youth decide to become Baha'is? By what process do they arrive at this decision? Well, I agreed to be one of her interviewees, and I've never forgotten it, because after a few rather intense questions about growing up as a Baha'i, she asked me quite simply, why are you a Baha'i? And I answered by telling an experience I had during a national convention when I was maybe eight years old following an incredible arts, uh, evening arts presentation which featured, among others, Nancy Ward, Godin Monroe. We were walking back towards our car and I just started crying and crying. And my mother very calmly, channeled it very well, calmly and lovingly asked me what was wrong and I said, nothing, I'm just so happy. 
This was, I answered my friend, why I'm a Baha'i. It was not something I remember someone saying to me in particular or attending Baha'i class or any other activity. It was what I felt to be the spirit and atmosphere permeating my childhood. And in particular that night, a feeling which since then I try to humbly recreate on stage, that sense of spirituality that Shoghi Effendi refers to. To me, this is the power of the arts, that it can open up to us that mystical state, which is the essence of the religious experience, according to Shoghi Effendi. I'd like to touch upon a few aspects of my creative process as I go about trying to mold a group of individuals in front of me into a shape, a form, a texture, a feeling. I title my presentation, The Creative Process, A Mirror of Everyday Life, because in the whole summation of an artistic process, one is confronted with a spectrum of emotions and turbulence and tests that are at the very core of our daily, core of our daily life and which offer the artist an unprecedented opportunity for personal growth. In essence, we think we have a semblance of control over our lives, but really what we should be doing as Baha'is, as we know, is trying to submit ourselves to the will of God, to be receptive and open to the unexpected. This is not any different in the studio when working on a choreography. In a choreographic process, you are dealing with dancers, artistic directors, musicians, administrative bureaucrats, costume designers, lighting designers. There is an abundance of opportunity for challenges and tests. You don't have control. You do not have control over whether people will like your work as much as you'd like them to or whether your initial idea or inspiration will be brought to fruition the way you anticipated in the early stages. You have to keep your ego constantly in check. You must be totally detached from what surrounds your process. In the studio, as in life, you really don't have control over anything. What you do have control over is your motivation and integrity during the process. Now, of course, a professional artist has worked at his craft consistently throughout his life and has acquired capacities and knowledge about shape and form, but I'm talking about seeking guidance constantly during the creative process. Abdu'l-Baha said, we must strive to that condition by being separated from all things and from the people of the world and by turning to God alone. It will take some effort on the part of man to attain to that condition, but he must work for it, strive for it. Our spiritual perception, our inward sight must be open so that we can see the signs of, and traces of God's spirit in everything. Everything can reflect to us the light of the spirit. Although I know I'm not a beginner when I enter a studio, that with every project that I've done in the past, I've acquired knowledge and perfected and refined my craft, I still feel completely overwhelmed at the beginning of a project. It is a very solitary process, but not a lonely one. As this quote can attest to, we, we are never alone. God is always with us. I can honestly say that the few moments of true happiness for me have come when creating. When it feels right and it falls into place and you look up into the, into the sky and you say, thank you, God. Ya Baha'u'llah. I say a lot of Ya Baha'u'llah in the studio. Creating is truly an act of worship, as Abdu'l Baha says, because it is, it is such a challenge the ultimate exposure of oneself, it forces you to elevate your character, your spirit, and your intentions before, during, and after the process. Often dancers come up to me after we've worked on a project together and they thank me and say that it was such a wonderful experience, they felt respected and appreciated as people and as artists, and I say, well, you're welcome. Um, but I'm really just treating them as I would like to be treated if I was working for a choreographer, which I've done for many years. If you don't, I mean, simply, if you don't treat them with respect, uh, which is something that does not, which is, does not always occur in this profession, how do you expect them to be willing to invest their heart and soul into your vision? This is ultimately why the process of creating a work is more satisfying than seeing your work on stage which more often than not is an extremely painful experience, the ultimate test of detachment. <laughs> for you as choreographer have placed your work in the hands of the dancers, people that for the most part you don't know personally at all. You must trust them. 
Dance is an art form that is in constant flux. It is live theater. There are no two shows the same. How you collaborated with them, the attitude with which you dealt with them, the spirit in which you shared your ideas all affect the outcome of the performance. As I look back on my years as a dancer, dance was not something that I felt deeply passionate about in the sense that dance was everything. As a result of some childhood process, I somehow acquired the idea that passion, being passionate had a very negative connotation. During my whole career as a dancer where I was a very emotional and expressive performer, at least I always felt I was, I always had the idea, this idea in the back of my head that I had to limit my artistic expression to stay in control. Now I truly enjoyed being a dancer. I wasn't gifted with the perfect ballet physique. physique. I was tall, which had its, disadvantage, which had its disadvantages, but I had a wonderful career. I was relatively injury free and I danced some of the preeminent works in dance history. I got to see the world. But dance ironically remained a constant battle of wits for me. I would often get extremely nervous and stressed out for performances with much anxiety and insecurity. Now I bring this up because I had to be a dancer, be after, I had to be a dancer before being a choreographer. And when I started choreographing as a teenager, I knew that I had discovered something that was truly special to me, that I truly had a passion for. And this excited me very much. And I kept saying to myself, well, if this continues to go well, I will pursue it, but who knows what the will of God is for me at this point in my life. Then as I moved on from project to project, I started saying, well, if this is God's will, this is what I really would like to do. This is my craft that I want to pursue. This is my calling. And I was really pleased to read what Baha'u'llah says in tablets as well. He says, true alliance is for the servant to pursue his profession and calling in this world. To hold fast unto the Lord, to seek not but his grace, inasmuch as in his hands is the destiny of all his servants. Somehow this legitimized the passion that I felt. I had discovered something that I truly had a passion for, a calling. Now, of course, if you look at what Baha'u'llah says, you see that he does not say that passion is a bad thing, but that one should not indulge one's passions. He admonishes us in the Kitabi Akdas to do away with evil passions and selfish passions. In the Baha'i prayers, Abdu'l Baha talks about, help me to subdue every rebellious passion. Uh, on, on listening to music, Abdu'l Baha asks us not to overstep the bounds of propriety and dignity. These are all warnings reminding us that passions can lead us down dark roads, whereas some can lead us in service. As an artist, this is evidently clear to me. It is so easy to become wrapped up in one's work, to withdraw, to become obsessed, to become a potential recluse. This is what Baha'u'llah is warning us about, that it takes moderation and discipline to have stability in life. Many of the world's greatest artists weren't the most stable people. Many of the, <clears throat> you can be a really great artist and yet be a very unpleasant person. Other aspects of your life can suffer greatly, for it is hard to be an artist. It means being intimately connected with one's emotional being, in my case, it means living life's highs and lows very intensely. It is therefore hard to be married to an artist. I was talking about this with Gary before. The trick is for an artist to marry another artist, and then you really get fireworks. <laughs> <clears throat> the great folk singer Joan Baez said something interesting. She said, uh, the easiest kind of relationship for me is with 10,000 people. The hardest is with one. This is why Baha'u'llah's strong ins insistence upon the importance of family life for me has tremendous meaning. I'm married and have two children, by the way. There is nothing more important than the family. This has grounded my artistic pursuits in a firmly ro rooted reality of where my priorities lay. You know, the discourse in the art community, is this for me? Okay. <laughs> not used to giving speeches. <laughs> the discourse in the art community, in my experience, is not permeated with cultivating this sense of spirituality that Shoghi Effendi mentions. Rare are the conversations I've had about the God-given reality behind producing a work of art. 
Nonetheless, Baha'u'llah explains that everything in this world has been enthused with the Holy Spirit through his coming, whether people understand this or not. And that's, I have here the same quote that Gary put up about, um, all the wondrous works ye behold in the world have been manifested through the operation of his supreme and most exalted will. Through the mere revelation of the word fashioner, issuing forth from his lips, such power is released as can generate through successive ages all the manifold arts which the hands of man can produce. You know, there's so much information in, in this quote that God the fashioner has sent down all we need to produce the most refined art imaginable. Some of the wor world's greatest artists acknowledged that they were aided by a higher source. We were talking earlier about great works of art when first produced, uh, that were, when first produced were considered incomprehensible or awful. A great example of mine is Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. When it premiered in 1913, it caused a violent uproar. It was scandalous. Audience screaming, dr they were drowning out the performance. And you listen to the Rite of Spring today, which is now considered a masterpiece, which it is, and it would still be considered avant-garde. Stravinsky said, quote, I was guided by no system whatsoever. I heard and I wrote what I heard. I am the vessel through which the rite passed. And Gustav Mahler, who was, wrote some incredible symphonies when he didn't have to make a living as a conductor, described the movements in his incredible third symphony as essentially a tribute to the kingdoms of God. He titled the second movement, What the Flowers in the Meadow Tell Me. What the, the third movement was, What the Animals in the Forest Tell Me. The fourth movement was, What the Night Tells Me. The fifth movement, What the Morning Bells Tell Me. And the sixth movement, which is absolutely incredible. If you, Mahler's third symphony, go buy it. He called it, What Love Tells Me. He said, however, he claimed that he could have just as well called it what God tells me. And it is so true when you listen to it. So I'm almost done here. I want to show you a, a section of a work of mine. A few words about dance. I have this conversation with a lot of people. When they look at dance, they, uh, they feel like they don't understand it or they're, they don't know enough about dance to appreciate it. One should look at dance as one looks at a painting or listens to a piece of music. One does not try to understand a piece of music. You listen to your favorite piece of music, why? Because it makes you feel a certain way. When you look at a painting, that's just what you do. You look at it and are receptive to what comes across. You don't initially analyze. You don't initially analyze the technique or look at where the artist grew up to understand the work, for example. Dance is not any different. You do not have to be a connoisseur to get something out of it. In a society with manipulative laugh tracks on sitcoms that tell you when it's funny, when you're supposed to laugh, or when you're supposed to feel sad, you know, cue the morose piano on ER. You know. <laughs> we have compartmentalized, compartmentalized our emotive response. We have forgotten how to feel from within. In art, not everyone, not everyone will process the information the same way. It will mean one thing to one person, but something else to another. It is incredible to have people come up to you after a show to share what a particular image meant to them. In my work, there is often a certain feeling of anxiety, of a desire to surmount, surmount obstacles, to struggle out of a situation, to reach a higher plane of understanding and existence. This is, per this is perhaps my own humble way to talk about our intrinsic nobility and to elevate man's rank. When creating, you start with a vision, and as the work emerges, it takes on a life of its own. And this work of art becomes an offering, a gift that comes out of a very solitary process and then shared with others. It is no longer a part of you. You have done your part. So um, I've timed this very well, so I should have, I got 15 minutes of excerpts to show. Yes, so I'm gonna show you, uh, video is terrible for dance. I mean, it doesn't compare to live theater, obviously. I hate having to do this, but nonetheless, it's what we have to do, it's what I wanna do. I'm gonna show you uh, an excerpt of a piece I did in 1999 called an excerpt of uh, the, third, the third and fourth movement uh, of a piece I did called Taslim. And uh, Taslim, uh, Persian friends will know what that means. 
I hope I ex explain it well. Uh, Taslim, uh, I was searching for a word which explained the ultimate test in life and, how to, and our mindset. Um, Taslim is that condition where you are totally overwhelmed by something and you have no choice but to surrender yourself to the will of God. And uh, you know, there are the tests in life that we know we have to deal with, like going to the dentist to get a root canal. That's one kind of test. <laughs> And then there's the other kind of test, which you're totally, you feel totally unprepared for. And tazlim means that mindset where one throws up one's hands and says, okay, God, I'm in your hands. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. In Gleanings, Baha'u'llah says, the soul that has remained faithful to the cause of God and stood unwaveringly firm in his path shall after his ascension be possessed of such power that all the worlds in which the Almighty hath created can benefit through him. Such a soul provideth at the bidding of the ideal king and divine educator, the pure leaven that leaveneth the world of being and furnisheth the power through which the arts and wonders of the world are made manifest. In my delusions of grandeur as a composer, I uh, sometimes imagine that I know who's assisting me. I like to imagine that the Almighty looks down on me and he, he sees what I'm working on at the time. And, uh, and he'll say, hmm, she seems to need a little help perhaps with her counterpoint. Uh, Handel, you are a master at this. It's, uh, would you go and, and assist her and he'll say, O oh, almighty ideal king and divine educator, I live only to serve your bidding. But she really sort of has a good handle on her counterpoint. The framework within which, you know, her harmonic framework is perhaps a little beyond what I'm used to doing. Might I suggest Vaughn Williams? And so the almighty will turn to Vaughn Williams and um, say, can you assist her, please, with, with her harmonies? And Vaughn Williams will say, Oh, almighty ideal king and divine educator, I live only to serve your bidding. But did you hear what happened the last time I helped her with her harmony? <laughs> She's working on, a, on an opera. Might I suggest Giacomo Puccini? And so the almighty will turn to Puccini who can't think of an excuse to get out of it. <laughs> but Lord, she calls me Jack. <laughs> and so poor Jack Puccini, who can't come up with a good excuse, gets sent down and he goes, hello, anybody home? <laughs> but just in case you, you think I, I don't take the process seriously, let me assure you I do. I take it very seriously. And for me, it's um, like childbearing and motherhood, one of the most exalted of, of all uh, careers. And uh, I know whereof I speak. I have a child. Um, my beloved little magnum opus, Kansen, who read uh, for uh, Karen during the second half of the gala. Um, Somewhere along the line, the, the, the seed of inspiration is planted. And uh, sometimes uh, it's because I've been reading something, sacred text, and it will strike me that, ooh, this might be nice if we said it. Um, and sometimes it comes at really odd times when I'm doing something else. Uh, it came to me one time uh, at, at a recital uh, and I was just enthralled at what I was listening to. It was Strauss, uh, an entire program of Strauss. And all of a sudden, I he started hearing these bells in, in my head. So I pulled out the first piece of paper and started writing stuff down. And, and my daughter's going, oh, my God, what does she think she's doing? <laughs> and, and I was just trying to notate little, little motives before they you know, flew away, and I didn't hear them anymore. And then I looked at what I'd written it on. It was the back of a child support check. Um, 
so you just sort of never know when or, or what time <laughs> these, are, these little things are going to happen. Um, then there's a gestation period. I, I try to feel the rhythm of the text since I work primarily with, with vocal music. Um, and for me, the, the, text, the text has to come first. The, 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 the music should serve the text. And I'm not good with words, um, but I work uh, with the best lyricists in the universe. I, I set sacred text um, whenever possible. And um, I sort of hear melody and harmony in, at the same time uh, in my head and... Um, some people probably think I'm schizophrenic. I sometimes start conducting the concourse. My daughter says, Mom, what are you, what are you, what are you conducting? And you don't hear that? <laughs> no, you're conducting phantom music again, are you? <laughs> um, and then there's, there's the labor uh, process. And uh, I have to pace and groan and scream and cry and grunt and push. And, and it's not a pretty sight. Um, you, you can ask my daughter. Um, and then finally, the, the, the infant presents itself to the world, to the material world. And, and like a child, it has to be nurtured and loved and educated and disciplined and tinkered with and all of that is when the piece is being uh, taught to the performers in my capacity as um, choir director. This is, this is a very great bounty to, to see this baby um, start to grow and develop. And then finally, um, hearing it performed for the first time I'm going to get sappy here. It's a lot like watching your baby walk for the first time. And those of you who attended the gala on Saturday night heard my newest baby, watched my newest baby walk for the first time, the opera vignette from Zainab. Thank you. With the... Be <laughs> Jolene has gotten to know me on this trip. Um, with the beautiful voices of uh, Catherine Rasek and Leonard Whiting, the fabulous tenor. Um, a composer's work is just so much ink on a page without the performers who bring it to life. When we're talking performance art, you know this. It's, it's just so much notation until, until you have the, the dancers to work with. And for you it's a little different because it's not a performance art. But, um, but anyway, so that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And um, <laughs> what uh, another aspect of, of all this uh, I wanted to talk about is, um, and what they put in the program, was the concept of managing art with propriety. And I realized that this um, is a very delicate subject and we Baha'is uh, really haven't even begun to address uh, what all that might mean. Um, I, I want to stress that these uh, are solely my opinions uh, based on my own personal limited understanding of the writings and what they say about the arts. And um, I will speak as a musician because that's what I know best. I was not encouraged to continue in dance or art. Um, <laughs> being the kind of kid that tripped over the flowers in the carpet and um, <laughs> not terribly graceful with a paintbrush. Um, uh, some basic ex assumptions for this presentation is I'd, I'd like to address the subject from the perspectives of uh, the artists and uh, arts programmers like um, what I did with my summer vacation this year, um, and, and arts consumers, you know, uh, just the general community. It's going to mean many things to many different people, but I, I think we will find that there's an awful lot of common ground as well. Most importantly, before we address any issue, is that as in all things, whatever progress we make, 
it must be rooted very firmly in um, our study of what the writings have to say. And I think uh, in order for us to begin to learn how to manage art with propriety, we need to develop a program of systematic study of what uh, the writings have to say. And I'm very happy to report that um, steps are being taken in that direction. Um, two years ago, during my tenure at the House of Worship as the music director there, um, I published a little book. Uh, well, it's actually not so little. It's uh, 100 pages of 11-point type called A Gift of the Holy Spirit. I compiled the three compilations on the arts that have come out of the World Center, plus, um, oh, everything related that I could think of, and it takes you on a journey from the source of all art to, uh, through various uses of the arts, the need for uh, excellence and scholarship in the arts, special instructions for uh, the Mashakal Azkar and, and the Hazaratal Quds and on into the realm of professional and personal behavior. And I, I actually started such uh, deepening lessons. We, we started our own study circle five years ago when, when we um, stood up that choir. And every week we made it part of, we made deepening part of our rehearsal routine. And we found this very, very useful. I think this is an element of learning how to manage art with propriety. It, when you're talking a, about performance art, the longer a group is together, the more you build a group identity. You get to know each other's strengths and weaknesses, and um, you can learn how to, to compensate for each other, of course, but also how to draw strengths from each other in many different ways. Um, some are better singers, uh, some are better uh, note readers, some have uh, more sense of interpretation, um, some have better senses of humor, <laughs> um, some are very punctual, um, some are very good organizers, and we all learn how to, to draw from each other and, and helping, uh, deepening and studying together besides increasing our knowledge of what the writings have to say, was instrumental in our getting to know each other on a personal, very personal level. We started to understand how each other's mind works. And that's very important. You can, you can put together an ad hoc performance group and it'll be wonderful. And, and it'll be a, a, fa a fabulous bounty like no other. Um, and it's uncreatable. But the ambience that, that it brings to the performance is very different from the ambience that you will feel from a group that is used to functioning together and working together on a steady basis, on a regular basis. And so that was the purpose when I first put this book together, but um, a lot of people were interested in it, and so I... Uh, I started producing it. It's, it's published by a really obscure little company called Celestial Navigation. Kind of a nice metaphor about how we wander through daily existence, perhaps. Um, and uh, is findable <laughs> if you're interested in it. Anyway, um, I, I took the title of, of this address, Managing Art from Propriety, from a uh, somewhat obscure reference um, from Abdul Baha, it's found in uh, Baha'i World Faith and is one of those that has been authenticated. And I want to read it for you. It says, in this great dispensation, art or a profession is identical with an act of worship, and this is a clear text of the blessed perfection. Therefore, extreme effort should be made in art and this will not prevent the teaching of the people in that region. Nay, rather, each should assist the other in art and guidance. For instance, when the studying of this art is done with the intention of obeying the command of God, 
This study will certainly be done easily, and great progress will soon be made therein. And when others discover the fragrance of spirituality in the action itself, this same will cause their awakening. Likewise, managing art with propriety will become the means of sociability and affinity, and sociability and affinity themselves tend to guide others to the truth. The points, um, the most salient points that I found in this um, statement are those on the source of art and the high station of the arts and artists. Um, an exhortation to make an extreme effort uh, in art as an act of obedience to God. And then the positive consequences of infusing spirituality into the arts and managing them with, with propriety. Um, my wonderful colleagues here have already gone into uh, wonderful writings about how all art is a gift of the Holy Spirit. I want to add one to that um, from uh, one of Baha'u'llah's tablets. He says, it hath been revealed and is now repeated that the true worth of artists and craftsmen should be appreciated, for they advance the affairs of mankind. Isn't that amazing? What, what a tremendous, what a tremendous burden <laughs> that is to think as, as artists, it, but it's a tremendous bounty as well to know that we are given such equal status with, with, the, other, with the other professions in the world. Um, very often, um, we tend to think of the arts and the sciences, and I know this, is, this has been talked about too by, by my colleagues here. And I wanna, I wanna give a little bit different notion about, um, about arts and, and science, how, how we might look at them. I'm, I'm uh, turning into a real geek in my old age. I love the dictionary, and I love to look for the etymology of words. The word science comes from the Latin word to know, but Farther back than that, its Indo-European roots are the word to cut. In order to know something, to understand it, we cut it apart and examine the pieces and see how they fit together, how they interact, how they amplify each other, how they cancel each other out, how they work together, how they combine in new ways. That's what knowing is about. That's, that's the material world. We, we have, and, and music and art has been called a praiseworthy science at the threshold. We, we cut things apart to see how they work how, and, and, and how best they, they assemble themselves to work most efficiently and, and effectively. The flip side of that, the yin to that yang perhaps, or the shakti to that shiva, um, is the word art, which comes from the Latin word art, but its ancient Indo-European root means to join. It's the same word from which we get arm, right? <laughs> um, and if we look at it, science and art could be perceived as two halves of the same process. You have the knowing, the cutting apart, and the learning that takes place in the material world. And then art is when you use that knowledge to join it with the spiritual realm and knowledge of the spiritual world. So art and science really do go hand in hand. And, and this is a very ancient concept. Um, colleges and universities today are still organized in such a fashion that um, they have the College of Arts and Sciences. It wasn't until, oh, perhaps the Industrial Revolution that there started to be this dichotomy between the concept of, of art and science. And so now, with the writings that we have, we can understand 
the confirmation of the ancient wisdom and start to bring the two back together equally 